Hey everyone, welcome back. Uh, in this video, I'm going to discuss a white paper that was published back in 2003. And the goal here is to kind of bring to light some of the da data that came out of this engineering uh, study. And so uh, it's strictly uh, to kind of bring it to light to the DIY home audio enthusiast to let um, people know that this basically exists um, among other white papers that um, are available through the Audio Engineering Society. Uh, it's, there is a paywall, um, but uh, I encourage you to pay the annual subscription because it does give you access to a wealth of information. Um, now, having said that, most of the content is very in-depth, requiring a very uh, deep fundamental understanding of the underlying subjects. Uh, so along that line, I hope uh, to, in this video to be able to describe uh, and kind of fill in the gaps uh, on certain uh, concepts in the in this paper uh, for those that may not be fully aware of uh, what it's discussing. Um, so I'm not in the scientific field. Um, I did get permission from Earl Geddes to uh, present this paper and I did have some questions for him personally, uh, not on a personal level, but just more um, in regards to the paper and just kind of answering some of the questions that I had, which he was able to do. So uh, thank, thank you to Earl for uh, taking the time to respond to my questions. So this is a white paper on distortion uh, and so I, as I continue to learn and progress in my own understanding of the topic, um, I've come across this paper which I thought uh, deserved more attention uh, because it does have uh, some notable, notable uh, objective subjective correlation uh, through a study that was conducted uh, in the in the for the white paper and so it produced some test data that correlated uh, the audibility of distortion and specific types of distortion and so uh, the title of the paper is the auditory perception of nonlinear distortion and so the authors is Lydia which is Earl's wife along with Earl Geddes in collaboration with the uh, University Eastern Michigan University um, so now um, I've uh, put a link to the paper in my blog post and so you can uh, go through it yourself and so in this video I just want to go through and discuss uh, some of the features of the paper and discuss uh, why I feel that it's notable um, and maybe some areas where I think that it would have been really helpful to kind of do to provide more information uh, and so now the uh, the paper seeks to validate the uh, new metric developed by Gedley, it's called the GM, which is a new type of distortion measurement. Um, now I can go to the best uh, description that I was able to find for the GM me distortion measurement is actually in the Vertin software manual, uh, which is the only software that I know of that can do the GM distortion measurement and so what it does is it applies a weighting system it conducts a test tone that's a single sign tone and it it's can be any frequency it can even be um, outside of the audible band and so it provides a weighting system and puts a larger emphasis on distortion that's higher order and so due to masking effects with the human perception certain lower order distortion products are masked and not audible and so what the metric the new metric seeks to do is apply a weight where higher order distortions are given a higher value in the overall um, metric amount or distortion amount um, the other thing that it seeks to do is um, it has a, a number of different um, functions where it brings to light where what we find more offensive to the ear and another uh, distortion type is crossover distortion and so that's a distortion where it increases as you lower the gain through the transfer function and so if you don't know what a transfer function is I want to I'll cover that in a few minutes but uh, what it does is it applies a higher emphasis or a higher weight to 
that type of a distortion and I'll show you what that uh, looks like in a, in, a, in a second here. So the other thing that's great about this paper is it does show statistical evidence based on a pool of 32 participants and so basically what they did is they had 32 trained listeners uh, listen to a the same 15 second piece of audio music soundtrack from Phantom of the Opera and so the participants in the study listened to the 15 second track and they evaluated the sound quality on a subjective scale and so they listened to 21 different versions of the same 15 second track and each version had its own specific type of distortion and so this is an interesting test in that it keeps the variables within the digital domain and so they used math, math, math lab to create the distortion and then recorded separate wave files each with the distortion embedded into the soundtrack and so um, they took the statistical data and tried to correlate uh, uh, what types of distortion were most offensive to the ear and so the paper claims that the purpose is to validate or verify the GM distortion metric by conducting this study with the 32 participants and then correlating that statistically to see if there's um, a, a, an R value significance uh, to the GM metric as a, a valuable metric. Okay, so um, now uh, this is in the paper itself. They've given four out of the 21 types of nonlinear functions. And so the first one you see here, so if you don't know, I'm just going to describe. So this is typical of any device. It's going to have a certain characteristic called an, an, uh, an NLF and a nonlinear function. And I'll just call it an NLF uh, moving forward just uh, for simplicity. So the, the input is in the bottom here coming in. And then you can see here, this is the gain uh, through the device. And now the, da the dashed uh, diagonal line represents a perfectly linear device. And so you can see here that at low gain settings, the device basically, you know, if it's a quarter uh, value here, it's going to output a quarter. However, as you increase the gain through to the through the device, you can see that, for example, at a full at the full uh, output of the device, it's not outputting one to one. It's actually um, around 0.6. So there's some compression uh, characteristics here. Um, with this particular example and so some other examples that they show here is that at very low gain uh, the device is very non-linear and so as you in increase the gain the overall distortion percentage drops uh, because it's more linear in the in the uh, the higher gain setting through the through the transfer so um, the other ones are just kind of uh, visually, they're just kind of random. And so they had to use a Fourier series to create these, but that's outside of the scope of this video. Um, so the idea here, to create wave files with these various nonlinearities, and then to evaluate in a subjective sense with the 32 participants, uh, the offensiveness of each, of each distortion type. Um, so what they concluded here, and you can read it actually in in this in the uh, in the study yourself. Um, you can actually see um, if I scroll down and look at the actual data, they have an R value assigned to uh, harmonic distortion, intermodulation distortion, and then the Gedley metric. And so the R value is simply how significant or statistically significant is the values uh, created from the study and they post graphs here showing you know is there a objective subjective correlation uh, with harmonic or with intermodulation or with the Gedley metric and so what they conclude um, is that there's actually an inverse correlation and a negative R number uh, for harmonic distortion which actually means that the participants preferred uh, harmonic distortion 
And so this is the first time that I've come across a study that shows this, which I think is quite impressive. Um, it certainly backs up my own kind of empirical experiences where um, I'll measure a compression driver, for example, and the uh, best sounding compression drivers do have a certain amount of harmonic distortion. I'm just going to make sure I'm still uh, recording here. So with intermodulation distortion, uh, they tried to correlate that and there was a positive R value here. I think it's uh, um, so here the uh, it says minus 0.42. So there's the negative negative correlation. And then there's a positive correlation of 0.35 uh, for intermodul intermodulation distortion, which was actually a two tone test signal that they used. And then for the Gedley metric, uh, there was a stronger R value of 0.68. So they're claiming um, that the Gedley is has a stronger correlation there with the perceived sound quality. So it's a fascinating study. Um, I just want to make sure I'm covering this kind of, I'm recording this all the way through, so I want to make sure that I'm covering uh, everything that I wanted to mention. A um, little bit of a tangent to this actually was while I was reading the Vertin software manual, I came across um, a section in the manual that makes reference to a Keith, How Keith Howard's uh, paper called Waiting Up. And so in this study, they actually looked at the phase relationship between uh, second and third harmonic, um, sorry, the phase relationship between the fundamental test tone and, for example, the second harmonic test tone. And what they found was that there is significant difference uh, in the waveform uh, when the phase is either in phase or out of phase uh, with the with the fundamental tone. And so why why does that matter? Well, when we do a typical harmonic distortion sweep, we're completely blind to the phase aspect uh, when producing a total harmonic distortion figure. And so when we discuss whether harmonic distortion is objective or preferable, um, the, I've never encountered the topic expand out to a discussion of the phase of those sideband products, which um, it's just another variable in the discussion. And so it just further complicates uh, the whole issue of uh, is harmonic distortion good or bad? And so it's basically a rabbit hole if you want to do another <laughs> deep dive on on that uh, particular subset of the topic on distortion. So, um, so the study uh, makes a valiant effort to uh, weight harmonic distortion and produce its own uh, metric. And so it's it's a great notable effort that I wanted to bring uh, to the to attend to attention uh, to so definitely something uh, worth reading. Um, my ultimate hope is to be able to include the GM metric in my regular test uh, test suite that I conduct for various drivers and loudspeakers. Um, it would be interesting to uh, kind of on on an ongoing basis compare the GM uh, against the traditional harmonic and uh, IMD tests that I'm doing, which I wouldn't say is traditional uh, in the sense that I'm conducting a multi-band, multi-frequency uh, uh, test using many test tones, which, um, as you know from my previous videos, certainly has um, a unique ability to really bring, to kind of flush out the the uh, non-linearities in a, in a driver. So. Um, now, the concluding remarks in the white paper uh, basically states that it's a launching point uh, towards further research. Now, I don't know why the GM metric didn't take off. I can uh, speculate myself that uh, manufacturers didn't really want a, another test that could potentially reveal how their devices really sound. And so, I also don't know how much marketing effort was done on on the part of uh, Earl Geddes uh, in terms of marketing 
the new metric to the regulatory bodies such as AES and IEC, um, but they certainly didn't seem to uh, adopt it um, from what I've been able to tell since 2003 when this paper was initially published. So um, I think that it would be amazing um, as far as uh, a pipe dream, maybe a wish, um, if artists measurement software or rew were to include gm uh in their in their software as a feature i think that would uh really help uh with the adoption of this test uh at least with manufacturers or with diy enthusiasts so um the idea here with the video is just to um bring attention to this study. I think it's it's really insightful. Um, the statistic side um, is plain to see there. Any uh, criticisms I have of the white paper, I'm certainly not in a position to criticize uh, somebody that's done such a, a valiant, notable effort here, but um, I did kind of I was kind of left wanting um, with the way that they've only shown the four different nonlinear functions. Now there's there was 21 total that they used, and so I feel like it would have been really insightful to see uh, the results um, and correlate that back to kind of visually uh, what those specific nonlinearities were. Um, now I think they could have uh, included that maybe as an addendum. Uh, to the stu to the main study, just if for those that are kind of had an academic interest in, in what they looked like, um, so that would be the only thing that I kind of was left wanting to see, you know, get so such valuable information and you and you want to know more, right? You get a thirst for more, wanting to see, um, you know, that that type that aspect. So um, other than that, an amazing study. Um, give it a read. So if you uh, like these types of videos, um, I do routinely look and study and read white papers uh, from various either AES or um, other, other sites. So if you do like this type of a video, uh, please let me know in the comments. Um, it's certainly a nice uh, refreshing departure from uh, the type of information you read on the forums and, and things like that. I think you're getting much better value uh, by doing a deep dive even though it's um, kind of grueling to go through and, and read and you almost fall asleep reading it all but there there certainly is some real gems uh, in the AES archives so um, that's it for today take care and have a great day